Brought to you by PrayLatin.com, makers of prayer cards featuring complete English phonetic renderings of Latin pronunciations. One of the things that people should keep in mind in times of uncertainty, a lot of people throw around the concept that the man of sin is here now, or that fill-in-the-blank politician, typically an American, that they don't like, is the man of sin. Scripture and tradition tells us what the man of sin is going to be, and I'm not going to give you everything here about who the man of sin is according to scripture and tradition. I'm going to focus on two 20th century figures, both Catholic, who give us a very good understanding of what the man of sin will be like and what the world will be like that will enable him to come. Those will hit very close to home for you. But we're going to start this by rooting it in the Old Testament, in what is said by the prophet Daniel about the man of sin. So this is from the book of Daniel, chapter 7. And from there, we will shift over to Fulton Sheen and Hilaire Belloc, 20th century, the minds who are far smarter than I am, and what they will say about what the, man of, the, the time of the man of sin will be like. So you can understand the times that lead to him and see how close that is to our time. Let me know in the comments if you think, after you hear this, if this sounds close to like we're close to it now. Here's the book of Daniel, or the prophet Daniel, chapter 7. In the first year of Baltazar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream, and the vision of his head was, was upon his bed. And writing the dream, he comprehended in a few words, and relating the sum of it in short, he said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea, and four great beasts, different from one another, came up out of the sea. The first was like a lioness, and had the wings of an eagle. I beheld till her wings were plucked off, and she was lifted up from the earth, and stood upon her feet as a man, and the heart of a man was given to her. And behold, another beast, like a bear, stood up on one side, and there were three rows in the mouth thereof, and in the teeth thereof, and thus they said to it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard, and it had upon it four wings, as of a fowl, and the beast had four heads, and power was given to it. After this I beheld in the vision of the night, and lo, a fourth beast, terrible and wonderful, and exceeding strong, had great iron teeth, eating and breaking in pieces, and treading down the rest with his feet, and was unlike to the other beasts which I had seen before it, and had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, another little horn sprung out of the midst of them, and three of the first horns were plucked up at the presence thereof. And behold, eyes like the eyes of a man were in this horn, and a mouth speaking great things." I beheld till thrones were placed in the Ancient of Days sat. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like clean wool, his throne like flames of fire, the wheels of it burning like a burning fire. A swift stream of fire issued forth from him from before him. Thousands of thousands ministered to him, and tens of thousand times a hundred thousand stood before him. The judgment sat, and the books were opened. I beheld because of the voice of the great words which the horn spoke, and I saw the beast that was slain, and the body thereof was destroyed, and given to the fire to be burned. And that the power of the other beast was taken away, and that times of life were appointed them for a time and a time. I beheld therefore in the vision of the night, and lo, one like the Son of Man came from the clouds of heaven, and he came even to the Ancient of Days, and they presented before him. And he gave him power and glory and a kingdom, and all peoples, tribes, and tongues shall serve him. His power is an everlasting power that shall not be taken away, and his kingdom shall not be destroyed. Thus spoke the prophet Daniel. He is seeing one who looks like God, who sits on the temple of God and appears to sit in judgment. One that will be accepted by many as the Antichrist, or as the Messiah, rather, when he is actually the Antichrist. And then what does he see? He sees our Lord come down from heaven and dash away everything that which he makes. It's good to remember that. Elsewhere, Daniel also tells us that the Antichrist will come from the tribe of Dan. Think about that in the context of whatever political or social figure you think is, you know, might be the man of sin. Unless he comes from the tribe of Dan, chances are zero that that person is the Antichrist. He might be an Antichrist, a little a, little c Antichrist, but they are not the Antichrist. They are not the man of sin. And it is why the church tells us to not speculate too much about the identity of the man of sin. But here we will now turn to first Fulton Sheen. He's going to tell us about the man of sin a little bit. 
that way we know what to spot if that day does come in our lifetimes. So in 1947, Archbishop Fulton Sheen, Sheen had this interesting take on the, on the Antichrist. He says, quote, The devil will not look like a comic book devil, but will be disguised as a great humanitarian. The Antichrist will write books on the new idea of God to suit the way people live and induce faith in astrology, so as to make, not the will, but the stars responsible for sins. He will explain guilt away psychologically as inhibited eroticism, make men shrink in shame if their fellow men say they are not broad-minded and liberal. He will be so broad-minded as to identify tolerance with indifference to right and wrong, truth and error. He'll explain guilt away psychologically as your inhibition and unwillingness to give in to your desires of the flesh. He will make men shrink away in shame if their fellow men say they are not broad-minded and liberal. He will be so broad-minded as to identify tolerance with indifference to right and wrong, truth and error. He will spread the lie that men will never be better until they make society better. He will foster more divorces under the guise of another partner being vital. He will increase love for love and de decrease love for actual persons. He will invoke religion to destroy religion. He will even speak of Christ and say that he was the greatest man who ever lived. His mission, he will say, will be to liberate men from servitude to sur su superstition and ideology, which he will never define. But in the midst of all of this seeming love for humanity and his glib talk of freedom and equality, he will have one great secret which he will tell no one. He will not believe in God. The three temptations of Christ in the desert will be repeated for the church and for individuals. The temptation to turn stones into bread as an earthly messiah will become temptations that sell freedom for security. As bread becomes a political weapon, only those who think this way may eat. The Antichrist wants no proclamation of immutable principles from the lofty heights of the church, but mass organization through propaganda. The Antichrist wants opinions, not truth. Commentators, not teachers. The Antichrist will prefer Gallup polls, not principles. Human nature, not grace. And to these golden calves will men toss themselves from Christ. They will have a new religion without a cross, a liturgy without a world to come, a city of man without a city of God. Politics will be their religion. They will have a form of religion, but deny its power. The Antichrist breaks down all national boundaries, the last down being patriotism, which dispenses men from piety to country so that they only become members of a revolutionary class. People will become lonely and desperate, but not wanting to humble themselves and adore the one true God. They will flock to accept a counter-church that promises to unite people in a world brotherhood and give meaning to their lives that they once found in the true church. Only those who live by faith will really know what is happening in the world. The great masses without faith will be unconscious of the destructive processes going on. From now on, the struggle will be for the souls of men. There will be a great division taking place, people dividing into two different religions as absolutes, the God who became man and the man who makes himself God, brothers in Christ and comrades in Antichrist. That is full Sheen. Spicy take. It's clearly influenced in some way by his uh, by him being in the mid part of the 20th century and the geopolitical concerns of the time. But the reason that comes hits so close to home for us is despite being nearly a century removed from when he said those things, they ring true today. Perhaps in a different way than he anticipated, but they certainly ring true today. Religion replaced with ideology. I mean, where we see that, we see that in the Vatican today. We see a, that brotherhood he spoke of being foisted upon everybody. And those who deny it, those who say, you know, let's slow down and maybe take a look at what, we're, what you're promoting. Anybody who resists it at all has ugly labels leveled against them. They get canceled in the public square for denying all these ideologies that allow people to live by pure license and absolute will to seek their own pleasure and their own sense of identity and meaning. And along all this, what I'm describing to you is what Hilaire Belloc called the new paganism. This is the environment that will foster the man of sin. I had the full reading, probably from five years ago at this point, on this channel, if you are interested. Hilaire Belloc's a, one of the great mind, right, Catholic minds of the 20th century. He was a historian, uh, sort of an amateur theologian. He was a philosopher. He spoke about political economy. He was a poet. He even wrote children's books. He was sort of a jack of all written trades. Um, and he's sort of the mascot of my channel. The figure you see with the sunglasses in the corner, that's Hilaire Belloc with sunglasses on. 
Here's what he had to say about the sort of environment that'll foster this. Quote, The new paganism differs and must differ radically from the old. Its consequences in human life will be quite different, presumably worse and increasingly worse. The reason of this is that you cannot undo an experience. When it moves away from the faith to return to paganism, again, it is not doing the same thing, nor not producing the same emotions, not passing through the same process, not suffering the same reactions as the old paganism did, which was moving towards the faith. The new paganism, should it ever become universal, or over whatever districts or societies it, it may become general, will never be what the old paganism was. It will be other, because it will be a corruption. The old paganism was profoundly traditional. Indeed, it had no roots except in tradition. Deep reverence for its own past and for the wisdom of its ancestry, and pride therein were the very soul of the old paganism. That is why it formed so solid a foundation on which to build the Catholic Church, though that is also why it offered so long a determined resistance to the growth of the Catholic Church. But the new paganism has for its very essence contempt for tradition and contempt of ancestry. It respects perhaps nothing, but least of all does it respect the spirit of our fathers have told us. The old paganism worshipped human things, but the noblest human things, particularly reason and the sense of beauty. In these it rose to heights greater than have since been reached, perhaps and certainly to heights as great as were never ever reached by mere reason or in the mere production of beauty during the Christian centuries. But the new paganism despises reason and boasts that it is attacking beauty. It presents with pride music that is discordant, building that is repellent, pictures that are mere chaos, and it ridicules a logical process, so that as I've, I have said, it has made of the very word logical a sort of sneer. The old paganism was a sort that it would be open, when due time came, to the authority of the Catholic Church. It had ears which at least would hear, and eyes which it at least would see. But the new paganism has only closed its sense, senses, but it is atrophying them, so that it aims at a state in which there shall be no ears to hear and no eyes to see. The one was growing keener in its sight and its hearing. The other is declining towards a condition where the society and forms will be blind and deaf, even to the main natural pleasures of life and to temporal truths. It will be incapable of understanding what they are all about. The old paganism had a strong sense of the supernatural. This sense was often turned to the wrong objects, and always to insufficient objects, but it was keen and unfailing. All the poetry of the old paganism, even where it despairs, has this sense. And you may read in those of its writers who actively opposed religion, such as Lucretius, a fine religious sense of dignity and order. The new paganism delights in superficiality, and conceives that it is rid of the evil as well as the good in what it believes to have been superstitious in illusions. Men do not live long without gods, but when the gods of the new paganism come, they will not be merely insufficient, as were the gods of Greece, nor merely false. They will be evil. One might put it in a sentence and say that the new paganism, foolishly expecting satisfaction, will fall before it knows where it is into Satanism. And that's Hilaire Belloc, giving you what the world will be like. How much of that sounds close to us? Well, let me know what you think of that in the comments, please. Do you think, if we're not there, are we headed there? For my money, I would say yes, that we're headed there. There are enough people still with a sense of faith that the other great condition for this that our Lord gave us hasn't quite been met yet. It seems we're definitely getting close. And that other condition is this. Our Lord said, when I return, will I find faith? Yes, there are faithful in the world still. And when the man of sin comes, Scripture tells us, and the traditions of the church tell us infallibly that, yes, there will still be faith in the world, but it'll be driven completely underground. But I'm curious what you think about what Archbishop Fulton Sheen and Hilaire Belloc had to say. Do you think that gives you a nice snapshot into what Daniel was talking about? Let me know in the comments, please. Hit like and subscribe if you haven't, it does help. So to sharing this on social media, that helps too. And as always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein, Ave Maria.